Hello, it's Scott Manley, and welcome to Going Nuclear Part 5. In previous parts, we showed you most of the tricks that were needed to make a compact, efficient, boosted fission weapon. Today, we're going to show how scientists took this to the next level with the hydrogen bomb. Regular fission weapons are limited in the amount of energy they can release because scaling up the yield requires more fissile material, greater multiples of the critical mass, which in turn requires faster assembly to avoid pre-detonation. The most powerful boosted fission weapon ever designed was about 750 kilotons. Scaling up to megaton yields would require a completely different design. Edward Teller began working on his fusion super weapon concept during World War II. In fact, he became so focused on the concept that his work on the more pressing fission project suffered. Some of the neglected work would actually instead be carried out by Klaus Fuchs, who would later confess to working as a spy for the Soviets. We talked about fusion-boosted fission weapons in the last episode, and how the fusion doesn't release that much energy, but the neutrons instead boost the regular fission reaction. It might seem logical to simply scale up the quantities of deuterium and tritium involved until it becomes the dominant energy source. One reason this isn't done is because tritium is vastly more expensive than the price of plutonium in terms of the energy released. Making both isotopes of tritium and plutonium requires bombarding the atoms with neutrons, and since a deuterium-tritium fusion releases about one-tenth of the energy of a plutonium fission, you would need about ten times as many tritium atoms, and therefore ten times as many atoms coming out of the reactor. And then you would still have to go through an isotopic separation process. It's also quite radioactive, adding to the many problems. The first proper thermonuclear device detonated by the US used only deuterium, which isn't nearly as easy to fuse as deuterium-tritium, but it was believed to be within the temperatures and pressures achievable in a nuclear detonation. The real challenge was how to achieve the heating and compression for significant quantities of material. Simply placing a reservoir of deuterium next to the explosion isn't going to generate the conditions required. Just like implosion requires shaping a detonation of conventional explosives, a thermonuclear detonation requires shaping the explosion of a nuclear weapon to correctly heat and compress the fusion fuel. The actual mechanism is of course one of the top nuclear secrets. Only a small number of official statements have been made, but based on the small amount of public knowledge, there are a lot of things that analysts generally agree on. Teller and others had several false starts, including one design called the Alarm Clock, which Teller named because he thought it would wake up the US to the possibility of a thermonuclear bomb. The US never tested this design, but it would actually be used for the first Soviet thermonuclear weapon, where it was called the Sloika or Layer Cake. It used alternating layers of fissile and fusion fuel uh, wrapped around the core of a fission weapon. At this time, many scientists thought that the mechanical shock wave from an explosion would be the best way to heat and compress the fuel. However, Stanislav Ulam understood that the majority of the energy would be in the form of photons, and suggested a mechanism by which this intense photon flux could be harnessed to generate the required conditions. Ulam would work with Teller to turn this concept of staged radiation implosion into a viable design. The teller Ulam design is contained inside a cylindrical radiation casing, sometimes called the hull rom. At one end of this is the primary fission bomb, which starts the detonation, and the rest of the cylinder contains a smaller concentric cylindrical fission, uh, fusion assembly, or secondary. The secondary's outer casing is typically made of depleted uranium, and inside it, it contains the fusion fuel, fuel, and at the core of this is a rod of fissile material like plutonium. A thick shield sits between the primary and the secondary to protect the top of the secondary from the initial detonation while allowing the radiation to leak around the outside into the channel between the interior and exterior cylinders. And when I say radiation, I'm really talking about huge amounts of electromagnetic radiation, photons, primarily X-rays, the idea is that this intense radiation can travel faster than the physical shockwave, and it can be reflected and channeled to illuminate the secondary with enough energy to implode it. 
The implosion is driven by the surface of the secondary boiling off and generating thrust in a similar way to a rocket. There may be other processes involved, but it is generally thought that this is the dominant mechanism. As it implodes, the fissile spark plug at the core reaches criticality and it generates a fission reaction which provides the heating required for the fusion processes. As the fusion reaction runs, it of course generates huge amounts of neutrons, which ensures a highly efficient burn-up of the fissile material in the spark plug and the casing. The neutrons from each fusion have energies of about 14 mega electron volts, which is more than enough to guarantee f fission of uranium-238. So much of the energy released in a thermonuclear device will actually come from fission of the uranium-238 tamper. The first test of such a design was Ivy Mike in 1952. It was huge. So huge, in fact, that it was referred to jokingly as a thermonuclear installation. It was a 75 tonne device, 6 metres tall, 2 metres wide, attached to a cryogenic cooling system because it used liquid deuterium as the fusion fuel. Deuterium was used because, for this first test because it was better understood than any other fuel at the time. The 25 centimetre thick steel walls were lined with lead and several centimetres of polythene. The primary was a version of the Mark V bomb, and the secondary, which was known as the Sausage, was a stainless steel cryogenic Dewar flask with a depleted uranium tamper and a boosted plutonium spark plug. Scientists estimated that the yield would be in the range of 1 to 10 megatons, with a possible maximum yield as high as 80 megatons, which shows just how experimental this device was. The actual yield was about 10 megatons and 23% of the energy came from fusion. The detonation completely destroyed the island, leaving a crater 1.9 kilometers wide by 50 meters deep. And the intense neutron flux also generated many new elements. Einsteinium and fermium owe their discovery to this, this test and they were found in the fallout. Despite liquid deuterium making for an unwieldy design, it was actually developed into a weapon as the 19-ton Mark 16 bomb, and five of these were built before a more sensible design was proven. The cryogenic liquid deuterium could be replaced by lithium deuteride, which is a solid at room temperature. Obviously, this dilutes the deuterium, but it was known that when lithium-6 was bombarded with neutrons, it would fission into helium and tritium as well as releasing energy. So the conditions during detonation meant that it would be also able to manufacture a source of tritium, which of course in turn would fuse with the deuterium and again release more energy and neutrons. For this particular innovation, the Soviet scientists, led by Andrei Sakharov, would beat the US. It was used in their first layer cake design, which would of course be abandoned after the more scalable staged radiation implosion method was developed. The first test of a Soviet staged device was the RD-37, and unlike the US, this was actually dropped from an aircraft, demonstrating the viability as a deployable weapon. Castle Bravo was the first test of a US designed device using lithium deuteride, and it didn't go quite as planned. It was known that lithium-6 could be fissioned by neutrons, but lithium-6 is only about 7% of natural lithium. So for the test, it was enriched to 40% lithium-6, leaving about 60% lithium-7, which was not seriously considered to be able to participate in the reaction. This assumption proved to be wrong. Lower energy neutrons don't cause fission in lithium-7, but the high energy neutrons from fusion reactions were able to cause it to fission at the cost of some energy. It would produce helium, tritium and another neutron, and that extra tritium boosted the reaction. As a result, the yield was 15 megatons, three times the predicted yield, and it was the highest yield weapon ever tested by the US. It ruined many of the experiments and created the worst fallout of any of the US tests. The biggest weapon ever tested was a Soviet weapon known by many code names, but perhaps best known by its colloquial name, the Tsar Bomba. The devices I've designed, described so far are two-stage devices, where the fission primary will ignite the fusion secondary, but it's entirely possible to extend this to a three-stage, where a two-stage weapon is used to trigger the third fu fusion stage. The Tsar Bomba had a yield of 50 megatons, 
but it used a lead tamper instead of uh, using uranium. Had it used uranium, the extra fission energy would drive the yield up probably to about 100 megatons. The use of lead casing, incidentally, also meant that the Tsar Bomba generated about 97% of its energy from fusion, which paradoxically made it one of the cleanest nuclear weapons ever designed in terms of fallout relative to the yield. The design, of course, was never deployed. Testing such a gargantuan weapon was primarily a political move. In reality, most designers worked to reduce the yields and shrink the devices while still exploiting the superior efficiency of the two-stage design. Every weapon currently deployed or stockpiled by the US is a two-stage device, with maximum yields measured in hundreds of kilotons. The cylindrical shape of the Teller Ulam design was probably because it simplified the mathematics, but of course in the decades since we've had improved simulation tools and better understanding of the physics, and this has allowed the design of devices with non-cylindrical radiation chambers. It's likely that all modern weapons use a two-chamber design with the primary in one chamber and the secondary in the other, with a waste joining the chambers. The exact geometry of this peanut-shaped design and the mechanism by which the radiation is channeled to compress the secondary are of course highly classified and beyond anything that I can speculate on without, with confidence. So that brings us up to date with modern weapons. In the next episode, I'm going to rewind and look how the fissile material in the core of these devices is produced. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.